brother is the Jar Jar Binks of yeah. Final Fantasy X. Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doop. Hi. Hi. Um, we're back. A dinosaur story. <laughs> so we're, we're we are rebranding for Michael a little bit. And we're focusing more on stuff that we're putting on our Facebook page, which hopefully you're following. Are we rebranded to Mike Gein? Our goal is not going to be to be funny anymore. We're gonna focus more on reviews of things, of video games and music and classical music, popular music, whatever we feel like reviewing. And we have a format for things now. Um, we have a spreadsheet that we have set up for video games for giving a numeric value, like percentage value to video games to see how good they are. And uh, we're gonna try and work one out for music as well and whatever else we do. So today we are discussing that bastion of late 90s, early 2000s role-playing game Gold, which is Final Fantasy X. Um, that was 2001, actually. Yeah, I think it was 2001. Yeah, so never mind. Early 2000s. Um, and we actually surprisingly agree on most of this game. Um, so we'll just kind of talk through it and we'll make sure to emphasize discussions about what we disagree on. Yeah, but so sort of general overall, the way we uh, work with the spreadsheet is we first give the game a percentage out of 100 that we think it deserves and then we go through in these individual categories and give them numeric values um you give them like each each line gets a points out of five type of thing so we, we have it broken down into a few larger categories story characters graphics design sound and gameplay and then once we give each of these individual lines and larger sections a score then we sort of tally that together and see what the general score is that we came up with and then we average that with what we thought the score should be so when it came to story i think we both were pretty much in agreement that it's overall a strong a strong plot line it's paced well um it follows a lot of tropes but it's a it's a it's an rpg um the, but the, the world is is beautiful and vibrant and makes sense for the most part and explains itself well. So that I think that's those are really strong points of the game. Yeah, I think that another point to its credit is that it's a game that isn't so concerned with uh, undoing tropes as it is with presenting them in new and sometimes unique ways. I think like in a, a good example of what I'm talking about here with trope today is um, the like so it's a sacrificial journey right is the is the main plot point and we've seen that before in lots of media in movies and games um but i think one cool way it plays with the trope is that the fates of the two characters are reversed so that the two main characters the two protagonists unit and titus um and in a way that's not like you know the cliche when people do it's so funny that some of these tropes have been around so long that the way of playing with them is now also a cliche. You know what I mean? Um, but I thought that the way they played with it and like usually when it's a sacrificial journey and people are like protecting this person and then you find out that the sacrifice doesn't die, it's because someone else like sacrificed their life for them, right? Um, but in this case, it's that he was, you know, Titus was already kind of dead. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that was... An interesting way to play with it because it allowed them to have that tension building the whole time of the impending reversal um, but they did a good job I thought and this is a pacing point of like bringing those discussions that, and the issues that Yuna would have to face with that afterward bringing them in gradually mm -hmm. so that like uh, we're not spending three discs like we did in Final Fantasy 8 of them just kind of fawning over each other aimlessly um, she only got a little bit of time to cope with it, relatively speaking. Um, but I thought it, it did a good job of, you know, making that those reveal those kinds of reveals in the game happened. I think well timed, and so I think that 
that's a well-timed moment because instead of the suspense being, is she going to die or not going to die? The suspense is more appropriately, how is he going to respond to this? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, another thing that sort of ties into at least many of the characters that also works with the story and how the world feels is, and this is also sort of more design, but as Final Fantasy games go, this feels more Japanese than the mm -hmm. rest of them, which I think is surprisingly refreshing. Because um, especially Yuna herself and her character's design, which we can get into more in a second. But yeah, I, I like that the world feels like it's somehow connected to, at times, feudal Japan, at times current Japan. There's a lot of like street style ideas thrown in as there are, always are in Final Fantasy games. I also, this is weird, but I like that this game gives them like what feels like a genuine, one of our first genuine romantic moments and intimate encounters in a long time. Like, mm. I thought that Eight really blew the boat on, is that the right expression? No, that's not that's, the right that's expression. That's not an expression. Nope. You're, it's clear from the beginning that Titus is interested in Yuna. And mm -hmm. whether or not she is, she's not going to let us know because she's so concerned with her mission. Um, but as she lets down her barriers, it feels natural that she and, and Titus have an actually mm -hmm. really beautiful moment together. <laughs> So we, we were talking about with the um, gender reversal with the, with the sacrifice. Could you go into that more? Because I think I know what you're saying. But I mean, all I'm really saying is in these types of games where there's a sacrifice and it's a female, usually she does end up dying so that to give the, the man a plot, like a, you know, a character development point, right? It's, it's women in refrigerators is what mm -hmm. it basically is. Um, but in this... The reverse happens. And they're in a weird way, too, I don't think this was intentional, but I think the other nice thing about Titus leaving is it really sets up Yuna as an authority figure now in Spira. Like, he's out of her way a little bit. Yeah. Yuna gets that really awesome moment at the end where she gives the speech, and I mm -hmm. just thought that was, like, a super powerful, like, female empowerment moment. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to characters. For the most part, we, like, feel pretty good about most of the characters, um... And this is this is not the uh, character design as much as the character's personality and stuff at first. Sorry, like, I'm too close to the camera. No, yeah, we're, we're we're trying to read my tiny tiny <laughs> notes. Um, so um, yeah, we don't like Waka, but we basically like everyone else in the main in the main cast uh, for the most part. Um, where we start to differ a little bit is how we feel about the villains. Um, in general, the um, I like the villains a little bit more than Ramin does. Which is funny, because Seymour is actually one of my favorite villains in Final Fantasy. Dumb. Yeah. He's not, he's, he's not one of mine, but I gave him a 4 out of 5 anyway. But anyway, um, I think this mostly comes down to two, of, uh, two villains where we differ a little bit more. Um, I like Jacked, because Sin is Jacked. And um, and I don't know, like I, I feel like even though the gruff, distant father, but he loves you anyway, is overdone in most of all media. Um, it we haven't really seen a parent-child relationship work like this, especially with a male parent in Final Fantasy uh, before this. Yeah, a lot of the times the male parent's just absent entirely. I don't know. Do you have any more thoughts on Jekt? Uh, my issue with Jekt is just that he doesn't feel necessary to me in the plot. Hmm. I just... I think that the game designers... The writers probably put him in uh, to give Titus some kind of connection to the main plot and to motivate him. But I actually think that kind of ruins one of the best things about Titus, which is I think he's one of... He's a very rare example of a well-handled, like... Of a character in a, in a piece of work whose function is mainly to explain the world to the audience. Audience proxy. Yeah. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. As, as Titus says throughout the game, this is my story, even though it's really not. Um, but if if he is the hero, then he needs a villain. So I, I for, for that, I kind of do like Jet. Yeah, but I... 
I also feel that that's stepping on Yuna's toes a little bit. And my other issue with it too is kind of more of a meta problem with Final Fantasy Final Bosses, which is that we all know there's always the boss you knew about the whole game, and then God, like the the random boss with a made up name you've never heard about before. And I actually, and this kind of ties into our next point about Yevon. I think Yu Yevon is one of the better handled of those kinds of, of characters. Of those kinds of characters, yes. So I think that the problem with Jack for me is that he feels like an obstacle to that, even though, yes, I get the whole system, like that makes it cyclical. But I also just feel like it steps on Yuna's toes a little bit. Because I do agree with you that it is Yuna's story. In fact, I really wish the game were more explicit about that too, because if you look at polls of characters, she is by far people's favorite from the game. So it's like, why did we even need another protagonist? People fucking love her. Yeah. It's probably why they made the sequel about her. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> only a completely different her. But that's a story for another video. Yeah. Uh, so just a little bit more about you, Yevon. I don't. It's the 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 surprise boss at the end is just always something that I hate. And uh, yeah, so I think that I think the surprise final boss is more of a trend in. RPGs than it is specifically in Final Fantasy because most mm -hmm. of them are not surprises. Um, uh, but yeah, Yu Yevon isn't a complete surprise and it makes sense, but I don't know, I just, I, 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 I still just really, like, it looks dumb, the fight yeah. is dumb, and I just like, why do we care? I mean, I, I know I understand for the world why we care, but why do we care about, you know, why did, why did we even have to make it a fight? Why couldn't we? Just someone like you know hit it and then it's dead because it's a little floating. Yeah, over. I think the I think a lot of what you're talking about would have been solved if the game had stuck to its original proposition, which is the idea that Yu Yevon was like the first summoner ever who summoned everything, and I the whole game had pictured that if we ever did fight him, he would be like Unaleska, like a ghost, right? Yeah. A, a, an unsent. Yeah. Um, I think he would have been a lot better if he had been a person still. Yeah. But the game rationalized it as him being that, like, blob. Yeah. With, I guess spider blob, right? That's yeah, little... it's got, like, tentacles. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, the game rationalized it as him losing his mind so much that he just also lost his corporeal form. Yeah. Which just... I don't get that change at all. Of all of the villains in that game, the one fight that is the most absolute terrifying is against Unaleska. She has yeah. the most weight to her. Mm -hmm. um, like she's the she's the oh fuck boss. Yeah, the yeah, and like and that the the animation of her is legitimately terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, and also what she can do to your party is yeah. terrifying. And it, yeah, I guess from that perspective, he's an underwhelming final boss. But you know, I would argue that Jet is also from that same perspective because yeah. I think Unalaska is just such a well designed boss. Yeah. Um, and that game has a lot of actually I mean that's a for a later down the spreadsheet but yeah. it has a lot of well designed bosses but Yu Yevon I, I agree is not really one of them yeah um, but I think I gave him a 3 instead of a 0 just because I thought I thought about other analogous Final Fantasy characters and compared to them I would say he's better handled yeah um, Yu Yevon could have had a ton of stuff to say to the party before they fought him because yeah. he's the originator of all this shit I mean of all the characters in that game I probably I'm still most curious about you, Yevon. So, you know, the other little mini points in characters are uh, diversity and gender parity. And as Final Fantasy goes, it's not, it, it's for the most part pretty good. Yeah. It could be more like ethnically diverse, mm -hmm. but there, we don't really see that in RPGs in general very much. Um, Speaking of diversity, the only form of diversity I don't appreciate that this game did not employ is having like a weird cutesy animal friend. I mean, Kimari is an animal friend. Was no, yeah. 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 Um, in general, I'm glad that the that most of the Final Fantasies do keep chocobos and moogles. Um, yeah. Because, and and they they are cute, but like they are usually changeable to fit the tone. But neither of the, those are in this game, are they? There are, there are no moogles or, or chocobos mm -hmm. or in town. I didn't think there's so. chocobos. That's in right. Time. There are chocobos in town. The only moogles that appear, though, I think, are Lulu's dolls. Yeah. Yeah, um, Lulu's dolls. That's that's an interesting thing. That was an idea that goes all the way back to Final Fantasy VI, because originally um, Strago and Realm were supposed to have weapons that were anima uh, um, animated dolls. dolls. Oh, cool! Yeah. And they just kept on putting it off. And the, we'll find another character who can use that weapon at some point in the future. And they finally gave it to Lulu. Oh, <laughs> 